excited to spotlight Katie um, and, and their amazing organization today. Um, I'll let Katie kind of intro herself, their solution, um, and then I'll open it up at the end for questions. I will be monitoring the Q&A and the chat. So holler if anybody has any questions. Otherwise, Katie, I'll turn it over to you, my friend. Yeah, thanks, Kate. So I'm Katie Mogan. I am a, what is my title? It doesn't really matter, but I'm a senior vice president. Um, I'm a vice president senior consultant with SEC Compliance Solutions. Um, and so really what that means is I'm an expert in SEC compliance. So if you're a registered investment advisor, um, with over 100 million in assets or 150 if you're a private fund advisor, you're, you should be registered with the SEC. And then with that comes some responsibilities and some requirements. And my job really and like sort of how our firm has aligned ourselves is it's our job to help you get through those requirements um, with as little headache and worry as possible. Um, I'll start by kind of giving you guys a little background about my firm, me, my, my boss, in our firm. So we spun out of a previous consulting firm that's now part of that big ACA conglomerate. Um, we are not a big firm. We are 10 employees. We are women owned and women led and we always will be. There will be no, you know, in a couple of years we've been bought out because we really pride ourselves in our small firm, the mentality and the flexibility, but also I think the services we're able to provide our clients are a lot better than some of those bigger firms. Um, and we'll get into that, but back to the history. So I started um, right out of college, really, for a private fund advisor. Um, we had about $5 billion in assets, and I had some experience in compliance there for several years. It was kind of, unfortunately, also during the recession of 2008. So that was a tough time to be in finance, as I think everyone probably remembers. Um, and so I made my way to a couple different private fund advisors in-house in compliance, and then eventually um, met Liz at our previous firm, and she said one day, long story short, right, she said to me one day, I'm going to go off with my little group of 40 clients, little, right, 40 clients, um, and I said, can I come with you? Uh, and she was like, yeah, let's do it. And so here we are seven years later, and 150 clients, we went from 40 clients and two employees to 10 employees and 150 clients um, and, you know, and, and growing and getting stronger and better every day. Um, we, our core sort of offering is to registered investment advisors or registering a state to SEC. We certainly can do that as well. But the core service offering we provide is the annual review process. Right. So as a registered investment advisor, you have to do an annual review. And I think the biggest question we get is, what do we do? What's an annual review? What am I supposed to look at? How do we document it? Because it's a friendly reminder with the private fund rule, they slid in this requirement now that it has to be written. And so there's a lot of questions, right? Like some things that you might do or your friend who has an RIA, they might do their annual review one way. And it really doesn't apply to you. Right? Some of the things that they're doing or some of their processes may not apply to you. And what's really important is that your consultant, whether it's me or anybody else, understands how your firm works and can provide you advice that is tailored to that. Right? Sure. If you're not a RAP advisor, you don't need policies and you don't need to disclose it. Right? If you don't do something, you don't have to disclose that you don't do it. You also don't have, pol have to have policies for things you don't do. Um, and so what we will do for our clients is, and it's scalable, right? So we can do as much or as little of your annual review as you find helpful. Some clients are like, do it all. And that has a lot of meaning to it. I can explain that in a minute. But, you know, it's all of our services are scalable. It's what works for your budget and what works for the time that you have to commit to compliance and other factors as well. But it starts with that process. The beginning of the relationship starts with what we call a gap analysis. So we're gonna look at your ADD part one, your ADD part two A. If you have a form CRS, if you have retail clients, you should have one. We would look at that as well with your policy, your code of ethics, your compliance manual, and your advisory agreement, maybe some marketing materials. And we're looking to see, you know, I always use the terminology, you're telling a story with these documents, right? You're disclosing things to your clients so that they can decide whether or not your conflicts are important enough to them to either 
reconsider if they want to invest with you, or you're at least required to make these disclosures so that they can make an informed decision, right? But there are places in your part one where you might disclose something maybe about your fees, where in part two, you also are disclosing something about your fees. So that language needs to at least be able to coexist together, right? And there are times where we see in, for example, your part 2A, you say you vote proxies, and somewhere else you say you don't vote proxies, or maybe you don't have a policy, maybe your advisory agreement doesn't disclose that, right? So that's where we're looking to see, do all these documents tell the same story? We provide you with comments, in track changes, we can amend your ADV, right? That doesn't like bring attention to you if you amend your ADV more often than once a year, that's totally okay. Um, and so we'll help you through that process. But from that analysis, which is all documented, so you get a copy of our comments, you get a copy of our suggestions and our review, it's all dated and signed. Um, we can then jump into the relationship of how are we gonna test your, your processes, your policies and procedures? What should we focus on? If your resources are limited and you want us to do just a small scope, right? There's your whole annual review. Maybe we're just doing a little piece of the pie. What should we prioritize? I often start the conversation with what keeps you up at night? Mm -hmm. As a business owner, there's something that keeps you up at night. Um, as a chief compliance officer, there's something that keeps you up at night. So we start there, right? And we say, if your resources are limited or if we're doing everything, but there's something that keeps you up at night, maybe we should test it more frequently. The cadence of our testing and the way we work the annual review is quarterly. We look at data in quarterly chunks and we do the review in quarterly chunks and we document it with you in quarterly chunks. Um, any more frequently and you're going to be overwhelmed and inundated with information and questions and data. Um, and also, like, we can always scale things, right? If you do something weekly, we can talk about it in a monthly or quarterly way. And when I say talk about it, what I really mean is we're documenting this process along the way. So on a quarterly basis, you meet with me or with one of my colleagues, and we help you. We use an Excel document, which if you're in finance, it doesn't sound as antiquated as when I say it, it sounds antiquated, but we all kind of live in Excel. And it's a great tool for this process because we can link different tabs when we're talking about things and when things are related. Um, we can show our work in Excel in terms of if we're looking at the trade water and we're dissecting some trades to see about best execution and to see about allocation using VLOOKUP and using pivot tables. Um, and then we can document, we can summarize what we looked at and what we found, and we can sign and date. We can initial and date that document. Um, and, and then we can also have conversations where I say, okay, Kate, uh, tell me what you did this, this quarter. Did you have any client complaints? Kate says, no, of course not. So we document that, right? Because if you don't document it, it's really hard to prove after the fact that you did this review. So that's part of this process. Like we are the ones that are dri driving the car, right? We're driving the annual review for you and saying, let's make sure we document these things on a quarterly basis um, so that things get documented. And at the end of the year, and this is, I think, where there's a lot of power in our process, at the end of the year, you're not scrambling to do a year's worth of testing and reviews and recalling what you did in January, right? Sure. I can't remember what I did last week. I also happened to have COVID last week, but I can't remember what I did last week. I don't expect you to be able to remember in a year what you did in your review and what your findings were. But if we document it as we go, the end of the year, it's like, bam, we're done, right? right. We have a template that we use for our clients where we can like fill in the important information. Some information is the same for all firms, right? There are risk alerts that apply to everybody. We summarize those for you. There are new rules that apply to some of you, right? But we summarize the rule and say, hey, this doesn't apply to Kate's firm because she doesn't participate in RAP programs. She doesn't have soft dollars. She doesn't have private funds, right? So we are addressing the fact that we're aware, right? Compliance wise, we are aware that these things are happening. But we also are savvy enough to know it doesn't apply to us. So we're going to move on from it. We also will do your regular, sorry, Kate, go ahead. No, you're good. I have a question on this. This makes sense. So you, you're, you're kind of hacking away at it over the course of the year. So it's not a big burden at the end of the year. My question is to dissecting it a little bit further. Is some of this stuff that like the administrative or the operations team can be putting together? Or does a lot of this fall on the advisor's plate? No, that's a great question. 
So also, but that's like a whole other side conversation too. Like, just because, <laughs> sorry, I blew the lid off. Okay. Just because something falls under the umbrella of compliance doesn't mean it's the CCO's job or compliance's job to do it, right? There are trading things that have to do with compliance, but that doesn't mean the CCO should be doing all the trading. And Got so it. what we do is you can document a report that the CFO reviewed or a report that an admin ran and reviewed. And we can say that's located in this file. But at least we're referencing where it's located, who did it, right? At the time it happened. And then as we get to the end of the year, there's less to do. It's less overwhelming. And it actually will end up freeing your time to do other things, right? Um, I think I answered your question, Kate. I'm not No, you did great. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I was wondering. I, I love to hear this. Yeah. And then we also will do training for you. You know, there are a lot of things that are best practices. And so when you're talking about a best practice, there's a lot of different ways to do that. We've got 150 clients that I can kind of look to and, and opine on and say, well, this is how one client does it. This is how another client does it. You have to tell me, Kate, right, you can use an example, what's going to work best for your business? You might say, I don't have a big staff to do this. And so we'll look at and talk about ways that we can get to the end goal. Like if there's, there's an end goal, but not everyone has to take the same path to get there, right? And not everyone has the same resources. And so those are all really important aspects. And that's why, you know, we really consider ourselves an extension of and a partner with you in compliance and not just a vendor, because we understand those intricacies. I have lists, I have templates, anything you need, but I'm not gonna give you a list, give you a checklist and say, Kate, here's your checklist. It's okay, Kate, here's my checklist. Let's go through it together. And I might give you some homework, right? Like things you need to do on your own and come back to me because I can do the audit work for you. I can review things after the fact, but you're in compliance at your firm. So we are not taking on the CCO, the outsource CCO role for you. You still have to have someone do that at your firm. And part of the reason as a firm, we have not offered that is we feel pretty strongly that it raises your risk level with the SEC. Interesting. At the end of the day, my goal for you as my client is to have an SEC exam where they come in and come out and it's as painless as possible. That's where my advice comes from. That's where my process comes from. Um, we do provide unlimited assistance during an SEC exam. I did say unlimited, which involves us helping you respond to your initial letter, going through it, drafting response, reviewing all the documents you're going to upload to the SEC, any subsequent requests, we're also going to help you. with. We will also prep whomever the SEC wants to speak to. We do a mock interview first before the actual interview. I'm on all of the calls with the SEC. And then this works kind of, it's like a symbiotic relationship here because I get so much out of sitting in on these calls and going through these request lists with you guys. But then on the reverse, right, on the back end of that, as my client, the fact that I've had 20 exams in the last two years really benefits you. I've seen a lot. Absolutely. Stuff, right. And so you benefit from that experience as well. And that's a lot of times where my advice comes from. This is what I've seen in an exam, right? Let's avoid this problem or this opining by the SEC. I often say they go down rabbit holes. And so we want to like cover those up before they come. Sure. Right. So, so I, I love this so much and I'm, I'm giggling because um, when I was in the operations role, I didn't, I mean, we had a compliance attorney, but the relation, it wasn't a partnership. I, I did not have a resource or someone to help like shepherd the process. I felt so, my questions always felt so silly because I didn't really know what I was talking about or what I was doing, but I was asked to go figure this stuff out. Um, so I can appreciate the level of handholding for lack of a better phrase. That's what that I talk about. Oh my we gosh. often will say we hold our client's hands. And if you don't want to hold my hand, that's okay. But I'll just <laughs> stand by your side and we'll go through it together. One of my ethos, right, my compliance, like, catchphrase is there's no stupid question when it comes to compliance. Because if you're unsure, right, that's where you should stop. That's where you want your employees to stop and come to you. Having an open door and compliance is really important. And being approachable. Um, you know, I think oftentimes people are afraid of compliance, but yeah. if we can get rid of that stigma and have them trust us and, and want to come to us and say, all right, I'm not sure what to do next, or I may have made a mistake. And then we're working with our 
employees, right? Like we, we want to know the mistakes. We want to know them so that the SEC is not the one finding them during an exam. I always say you guys like- are just a major boost of confidence, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so going back to some of our service offerings, so it's the annual review is like that core piece of it, right? Unlimited, unlimited assistance during an SEC exam. We will also do training, right? So once a year, like I often suggest code of ethics training. It's, it's amazing. You can have people in this industry for like 20 years. And then they're like, oh, my wife has a 401k. I'm like, yeah, you need to report that. Right? Like, wow. So, uh, I digress, but still, so training certainly, um, also um any filing so you've got the, right now we're like deep into adv season already with the, the annual amendment so part one two a form crs two b's um u4s and u5 13f 13g 13h um we can do private fund filings as well like form pf uh blue sky and form d filing and, and i often say like there isn't a lot we won't do for our clients so if you come to us and say, I need this, if I can't do it for you, I will help you find someone who can, whether it's outside counsel or, uh, you know, or an audit firm, if you need a surprise custody exam, we have a lot of relationships um, that we don't benefit from at all, except for we want you to be happy. And so we vet these relationships to make sure that they work for our clients so we can continue to recommend them. Oh, I love to hear that. Yeah, it sounds like it's, it's super flexible, which is nice. We try to be really flexible. I mean, we kind of have like our base of, of where our pricing starts. And then from there, it's as much or as little as you want. I have some clients that I talk to them quarterly. That's really it. We do unlimited consulting too. Like, so it's our core testing, unlimited consulting, unlimited assistance during an SEC exam. And the reason we've kind of come to and, and we don't do hourly work is because we don't want you to say, I don't want to spend X amount per hour to call Katie for this question. Sure. You're just going to call me because you know we're going to work through it and take as much time as we need to get to the solution, right? And I will always tell you, I, I am not an attorney. My business partner Liz is not an attorney. You don't necessarily need one, but I'll tell you when you do, if we ever get to that point. Pretty rare that you do, very rare. Um, but if that happens, I want the best for you, so I will tell you. But a lot of times I have clients that come to me that have been doing policies and procedures with outside counsel and been doing their annual review with outside counsel. And it's a lot of money and it's not very practical because they're attorneys and attorneys come from a different side. They come from the law. The law is not practical, right? I've worked for firms in-house and I've consulted and been in the business for a really long time. And one of the things I've learned is that, you know, pivoting for one client to another is really important. Because you, you guys all are very similar, but you're all very different. Sure. I can appreciate that. Yeah. Any questions? I mean, you know, I th that is really like, but that's our service. Um, we're pretty transparent in terms of what we offer and who we are. I mean, some of our sort of business, we don't really have a, a business model. Um, we have a business life plan that is really driven by our employees and our employees' happiness. And so... And a lot of people at first, when I talk to them, other small business owners, women business owners will say like, you know, how can it not be your client? But from my perspective, if my employees are happy, you will be happy as my client because my employees love coming to work. They love working with me. They love working with you. Um, and so that really is a driver for us. Um, you know, I work really hard, but I also have a family and that is just as important as my company and my work. So there's a balance there that we try really hard to, to find and maintain. I can so. appreciate that. I just have one comment. I'm giggling because um, people always tease me like, you're so passionate about RIA operations and CRMs. How does anybody get excited about that? And I'm watching you talk and light up talking about SEC compliance. And I'm like, how does anybody get excited about that? <laughs> so I'm, a, I mean, like it's, it's, Super nerdy, right? But like I found the right career for you me. You love it. Yeah. I am, I'm a rule follower and I always really love the law. I'm married to an attorney, bless his heart, but I am not a huge fan of attorneys. I thought that's what I wanted to do, but then it's like, gosh, this is terrible. Um, but this allows me to do those, a lot of those things that I enjoy, right? Reading a rule and interpreting it and then deciding like, how is that going to apply to client A, client B, sure. client C? 
Um, and I'm always on the phone. I mean, really most of my day is spent on the phone with my clients and they're wonderful. I love my clients. They're fantastic. So it shows. It shows. Um, we do have one question. Uh, actually, they're all kind of filing in. Perfect. So Tim's primary role is operations, yet he's also the CCO without any oh. compliance staff. His biggest issue is time. Um, and I don't have any internal compliance staff. My dream is to delegate all of the legal work, uh, the remaining uh, CCO to a partner consultant to work through the big issues, determine the direction for, direction for new initiatives. Do you guys offer some sort of service model that vibes with what he's looking for? Absolutely. Was it Tim was the one that asked the question? Yes. So Tim, essentially, you would still have to be the CCO and you can have other people help with this process and here's how that would work. So when we're doing our audit, our quarterly testing for you, you have to provide us with some documents, right? Like I need your trade blogger. I might need your client list. So you or someone you assign would be responsible for sending me the data when I ask for it. We would we use share files so that things can be sent to us securely. Um, so you'd have a repository in, in share file where when I ask for certain documents, whether it's a client agreement or a client custodial statement or a client invoice or your trade blotter, someone, maybe not you, maybe you, would upload it there. And then I'm going to do my testing and my analysis. And then I would say, so long as you have an hour or two, a quarter to speak with me, we'd be fine. And either you or someone else that can upload documents that knows where to find them, right? Like you may not know where to find some of these documents. But having the person that can have access to share files, really just having them get set up with us with their email and a and a and a password so that they can use share files, get us those documents. And that ties into what Diane's asking. She says, does your firm host a portal where compliance activities are listed and tracked? And do you adjust the fee based on the size of the firm that you're working with? So not the size, right? Because you could be tiny, but be a lot of work. It really <laughs> depends, it really depends on um different things so we would do a separate prospect call where you would tell me a little about a, a little bit about your firm how big you are how many clients you have what type of service you provide to your clients um and then what kind of work you're looking for me to do so those things all kind of dictate the price that makes sense what do just out of curiosity what do the other players on your team do so liz and i are the lead so we're the main contact for clients and then there are um, I don't, I don't like to do like a, an org chart kind of thing, but everyone works on testing. We all work in teams. So Liz and I always have a secondary. So you may talk to me primarily. And then every once in a while, you might get an email from my colleague, Joe, who's helping with some testing. Got it. It's really Liz and I are the consultants because we are the experts. So when there are questions and concerns and we're kind of wrapping up the annual review, we are the ones that are providing advice and making suggestions. Mm -hmm. But you may have someone else do some of the testing in the background, always overseen by me or Liz, probably me. Um, Liz is sort of capped out in terms of her client, her client load. Um, but you would have me kind of leading calls and leading and pushing the process. And I see another question about the size of clients, which ties into this. So register with the SEC, you're 100, 100 million or 150 if you're a private fund advisor, right? All the way up to my largest client is about fifty billion. So everything in between. I was gonna say that's quite the quite the range. Yeah, and we have internet advisors, we have private fund advisors, we have RAP clients, we have SMA clients. We, I mean, really, we have everything at this point. That's awesome. Yeah. I'll give everybody a little bit of space. Let them. If anybody yeah. has any other questions, we'll, we'll leave it open here. And then the other thing I think I, I didn't mention, but I should mention is we also help with annual updates to policy. Mm. Um, and that's not every year, right? Like not every year you need to update your policies. Um, if you, in 2023, a lot of my clients don't have any updates to their policies because they're not private fund clients. And that really is the major rule we saw that is taking effect in 24 and really 25. Um, but we certainly would, if there are new rules and regulations you need to comply with, we provide the policies for you and training so that you can update your manual and, and any staff that those changes apply to can do what they need to do and, and get that education from us in terms of 
to changes. Love to hear it. So she asked for a link. I put your website in. Um, we'll also post after this call. Um, it is recorded. Um, Katie and I will get together and we'll put together a follow-up email to everybody, including any additional documentation that you want to send off, Katie, or um, you know, links we really to get have, you. We really don't have to interrupt. We really don't have marketing materials. I mean, if you want to go to our website, a lot of what I said will be on our website in one way or the other. You'll certainly get to know our firm and the personality of our firm a lot better. My bio is there. My boss's bio is there. All of our support staff bios are there. Um, we really have a great team. Everyone is fantastic. Um, but that's really, I mean, we just don't need to, we, we actually don't market. This is really one of the main ways that we kind of get new clients. It's through word of mouth and referrals and relationships like this. Awesome. We, don't, we don't have a marketing budget. Got it. And we never have. Any other like questions? I mean, certainly I'm happy to answer questions about our services, but if you have specific questions and you're just curious, like how I would approach a problem you've had or anything like that, I'm happy to kind of talk about that. That certainly helps you understand a little bit more of like my compliance philosophy, which I tend to be pretty conservative, but <laughs> that's sort of my job. You said you were a rule follower, so I, I would imagine, imagine that to I be think, true. You know, I'm, it's funny, I'm a rule follower, but I'm not a huge fan of the SEC. I find them very frustrating. Um, I feel like a lot of the rules that they've been passing or that are sort of in the pipeline to, to become rules, like proposed rules really, are um, really handicapping small firms and making it really difficult for smaller firms to, to do their business. And, you know, the, the SEC, the government says they're so pro small business, but these rules are really costing small businesses a lot of money that they don't have to spend. Um, so anyway, that's a shame. It is, but you also see as, um, and this is not a political statement at all, but you do see changes as different political parties are in control, you do see the the commission shift a little bit and move back and forth. So that certainly is to be expected. And I guess I was on a call before this um, with outside counsel and my clients and outside counsel is saying that the private fund rule is currently in like the sixth court of appeals. So it's being challenged. So it may not get passed. Sure. The, annual, the written annual review requirement, I think will, will is here to stay. But if you're a private fund advisor, something tells me that that may change a lot, those requirements. Good to know. Well, you guys, anybody have any other questions while we've got Katie? Otherwise, um, oh, here you go. You got one. Can you see that one? I just see my, my website link. I got you. Can you talk a little bit about SEC audits? What kinds of firms do you see get audited most frequently and how painful is the process? That's such a good question. We could talk for hours about that. I'll try to <laughs> take five or 10 minutes. But so let's start at the beginning, right? You're probably going to get a phone call from the SEC saying, we're going to send you a letter. They started doing that because they used to just send a letter and now everyone Googles or calls the commission to say, I got this letter and it's really you because we're so now trained about cybersecurity. So now you get a phone call that the SEC is coming in. They send a letter within a couple of days. And that letter gives you typically two weeks to respond to 30 to 40 questions. It's number one is always an org chart. Um, number two is a list of your supervised person, et cetera, et cetera. There's always a client list or an investor list. They typically ask for a trade blotter or some variation of your trades for the period. The exam period is typically, again, typically one to two years long. And so you get about two weeks to respond to the SEC and you are uploading things through the SEC. It's called tight work. Um, it's their like their version of share file. It's the government. So it's not the greatest cleanest. Um, so you're uploading these documents, financial, your general ledger, um, your template advisory agreement, however many you have. And they will call through those documents and you may get a second request. You will most likely also have a request for interviews. They'll, and they will often either tell you the role, so head trader, head of marketing, CEO, CCO, or they'll tell you the person in charge of this. 
the person in charge of operations. And so then it'll be up to you to decide who they talk to. Mm. Uh, and then you'll do your interviews, which will typically take half a day or so, because each person is an hour to an hour and a half or so. Um, and then there may be more or less requests. And the number of requests that you get does not in, is not an indicator of the success or failure of your exam, but it's just them kind of researching and looking into things. And then, um, and you know, I would say three to six months is the average I'm seeing right now. And then you're going to get notified that they're ready for your exit interview, where they will go over any deficiencies if you have them. Wow. You they will talk you through them, but then they also give you a letter that lays out your deficiencies. Um, and then you respond to that with how you're solving those deficiencies. Sometimes it's you know changing something you've disclosed in your ADV and filing it with the SEC's website. Sometimes it's a change to your policies. So you're updating your policies and showing them that you've changed them. Um, I've also seen sometimes like fees having to be reimbursed to clients. So it may be like showing them that you've done that. However, you can evidence that. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, right? So I have clients that go have no deficiencies. I have clients that have a couple of deficiencies. I don't often see the SEC come back, right? They are usually in and out unless there's something really egregious that they're coming back to make sure you fit. The things that they're really focusing on are your agreements with your clients and the fees that your clients are paying and the disclosures you're making to your clients. Yeah. But those happen in like so many different places, right? Whether it's your marketing materials or your ADV um, or your website. And they're coming in now to an exam already knowing a lot about you. They are calling the internet and looking at your advertisements if you have any and your website. They're looking at your ADV part one and two. And so they're coming in, understanding a little bit more about your firm than we've seen maybe five, six, seven years ago. But they are still mostly remote, I'm finding. Um, it's not alarming if they come on site. I had one client who was examined by the LA office and their office is in, their main office is in Boise. The LA office flew to Boise to see them. They had zero deficiencies at the end of the day. So it was not an indicator of the severity of the exam or anything like that. But that's really the first one I've had since COVID that has been physically in person. Most of them are Zoom. What kind of firms do you see audited? What kind of firms do you see audited most frequently? There is no answer to that. It's, <laughs> it, is, it is truly totally random. Um, and I actually was at a conference this summer with the SEC in Chicago, where a similar question was asked, like what raises our risk alert, our, our risk level with the SEC? Because they talk about that. They do have some type of rating. They won't share what it is. And it's really interesting because it used to be that like custody made you really high risk. But then the SEC realized if clients are discl disclosing they have custody on their part one and their part two, and they're getting a surprise exam or they're doing something else they're required to do as a result of having custody, they're probably actually lower risk because they know what they're doing. They're following the rules and they're telling us. It's the ones that don't know they have custody. Those are the ones we have to figure out and find. So, um, and like a change in CCO, maybe if you have a lot in a short period of time, that might, right? Like raise your, raise your risk level with the SEC. But I have one client that does a lot of M&A. And so one year we had five other than annual amendments to their ADV. Wow. They haven't been examined, knock on wood. So I, I can't give you a great answer because it, it truly does seem random. Interesting. But with our clients, our process is pretty strong, I think, when we are helping um, our clients respond to the SEC because we essentially take their initial request letter and convert it to a response. So number one, we'll say, like, please write your org chart, and we'll have a response right underneath it that leads them to that document. Or if there's something that doesn't apply, we'll explain why they're not getting a document that they're looking for or asking for. And what we don't just say this doesn't apply to us. We'll tell them why. Um, and that kind of is like a map that helps start. Yeah, keep the SEC at bay. I get it. Yeah, totally. That uh, was a really good question. Any other? That's a really good one. Yeah, I've got another one here from Tim again. How do you address using hypothetical performance like model performance with clients and prospects in one-to-one -one meetings? The issue being how to indicate the client is able to understand the limitations of a hypothetical performance. 
That's a great question, Tim. So what I would say as a great rule of thumb is if it is a retail client, they are probably not sophisticated enough to understand hypothetical performance mm. in terms of like as a rule of thumb. Um, if you have information about that client as to like maybe their, their, their net worth, maybe you know what they do and they are in finance, you know, that might be something that you could use when you're in front of the SEC to say, well, Katie Mogan makes $2 million a year, I wish. And she works in compliance for registered investment advisors. So we think she is sophisticated in multiple areas, which allowed us to feel comfortable showing her this hypothetical information, right? That may not always be the case. I don't know who is client facing at your firm. And so they may not always have that opportunity or have that insight to a prospect. Certainly, I think the SEC has been pretty clear that they don't love hypothetical performance and they don't think it's appropriate for retail investors. Um, it's tough to answer questions about the marketing rule because we've had so little guidance. The SEC has actually said to me, point blank, we think the rule is detailed enough that you shouldn't have any questions. Hmm. But there are a lot of questions. Just Tim's question alone shows there are a lot of questions. And so right now, my advice is pretty conservative. As we see risk alerts and exams, I have yet to see a lot of feedback from my clients being examined in terms of this type of information and that kind of marketing piece, right? So I don't have a lot of experience to like opine on, but as we get that, we will pivot as a firm and our advice will pivot, right? So once, so if I knew Tim, for example, that you are a client of mine using hypothetical and I have a very small, small, small group that does, um, I would say, okay, I got to talk to Tim and I got to talk to Kate and I got to talk to Paul and I got to talk to Joe because I just had an exam where the SEC commented about the hypothetical use of client A. So now I have these four clients I need to go talk to to relay that, to give them that perspective so they can make a decision. Because at the end of the day, Tim, I will give you my advice, but you're the one taking the risk. So you have to kind of think about like, given what Katie's saying, do I not provide this information to these clients? Do I have a little checklist that I provide? Like your IARs are most likely the ones talking to these perspectives, right? So are they savvy enough and do they understand the severity of this to follow this checklist and to get this information? You know, those are conversations we have to have so that I can find a suggestion that works well for you. Makes sense. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. That was a good question. Anybody else? We've got some time. I'd love to hear it. This is this is a wonderful conversation. You're a wealth of knowledge, Katie. Thank you. I try. It's fun. It's fun to get to talk to other people that, you know, I'm a geek about operations and CRMs and you're a geek about, you know, compliance solutions. Yeah. It's fun to hear what everybody else does to make these businesses hum, you know? Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned CRM. That's like a tool that I feel like is is so multifaceted for advisors. Um the SEC doesn't often ask for like notes from your CRM, but I can't tell you how many times like tangentially it's helped with a client complaint and we can pull up those notes and we can show in a response to the client or sometimes the SEC, if the client goes directly to the SEC to complain, the SEC comes back to the advisor and says, we got this complaint from this client. Please respond to the client and copy us on your response. Right. If you've got notes in your CRM and you can evidence when you sent them a report, and you can evidence the conversation because your IAR took great notes in the CRM. Oh, my goodness. That I'll is tell you, uh, because you went there, that um, this was part of the inspiration for, you know, the, the business that I built was I was responsible for doing what we call like the quarterly risk matrix for our compliance attorney. And the first couple of times that I did it, the information was spread across too many places. And I was like, oh my gosh, the CRM, like we got to get all this into the CRM so that I can do exactly what you just did out of a single place. It's a freaking nightmare to manage when you've got it spread in all sorts of yep. spreadsheets and emails and DMs and texts, you know, that just, that doesn't work. <laughs> well, I'm glad you mentioned text, Kate, because we should not be texting with our clients unless we're archiving text messages. For if sure. you're not aware, in 2022, there was a group of those big brokers in New York City, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, who were fined like one point something billion with a B dollars because their employees were texting with clients. And it wasn't just like, hey, dude, I'm running late for lunch or something like that. It was like trade orders and moving money and an investment advice 
and requests and things like that. So um, just because Kate mentioned it, I will stand on my soapbox and talk about that. Um, I can certainly talk about solutions if people are interested, because I know that that's like a an area where people are just like, oh, what do we do? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, fire away. If you've got solutions, I'd love to hear them. It's a, it's wow. a hot topic. So one thing to be aware of, too, is like Apple is like this vault that is so difficult to penetrate in terms of being able to archive Apple like chats and like Apple texting. For whatever reason, the security is so, so strong that there are that like the Smarshes and the global relays are struggling to get the technology to archive those text messages. Having said that, um, there is a Zoom solution, I believe, and I think it's Zoom Teams might also where there's an app where the you link your your office phone number your client is texting your office phone number and smart and global relay can archive it and i'm giving you like some very high level rates right? i'm not an expert on this stuff i just know what my clients are doing so you can reach out to these different resources to see some of my clients have issued separate devices right because the other problem with text messaging and archiving is the systems aren't sophisticated enough to know that like when Katie and Kate are text messaging, it's business. But when Katie texts my husband, Jeff, right. that's personal. It doesn't right. have that sophistication. So some people, some employees are not very excited to have their text archived. One thing I do tell my, my clients too is, listen, if your employees are texting a client because they're late for lunch or to reschedule a meeting, that is so benign. Let's not worry about that. But let's make sure our client, our, our employees are educated to know when they get a text from a client that like crosses that line, they take that text message and they go into their email and say, hey, Kate, I saw that you're looking up, you're, you know, you got a lot extra money with your bonus this year and you're looking to invest in some emerging markets. Let's get on the phone and talk. There you go. So take that text message and you know, pop it in the email. Someone says, we recently started using the Zoom solution. Hijack the numbers in this archive with Smarsh and it's working great so far. Love to hear it, Tim. Another one of my clients is using that. I also posted, the, the link that I posted there is to our community. There's a whole thread in our community of advisors sharing uh, texting yes. integrations um, and how it plays nicely with CRMs, which is important. So I thought I'd put that as a resource there for you guys if anybody wants to jump in that thread and see what other people are doing. So Tim and anybody else, make sure your policies are updated based on you using Zoom and Smarsh in this way, right? If you decide to have a policy where you prohibit text messaging, you need to have a policy that says that. And you should train on it. If you're going to find a solution, you should, you should bring that into your policy so that it shows you have a solution. Because now, Tim, you should be randomly reviewing Smarsh text messages, right? right? business communication. So, so we want to make sure like full circle. Okay. Tim has another question. Tim's full of them. This is a really good one. Um, any thoughts on performing vendor due diligence? It's such an arduous process uh, to send questionnaires to vendors. Uh, then I wonder if I'm even qualified to properly assess the vendor's responses. Thoughts on this? Yeah. So I love that question, Tim. There are some um, cybersecurity vendors that are starting to do this on behalf of their clients. I know we work with Drawbridge a lot. I do not get paid to talk about them, just so you know. But we love Drawbridge. As a cybersecurity IT kind of um, vendor. And they will do um, third-party due diligence reviews. Um, but if you're going to do it on your own, I would say keep a list and track. Like you sent... SEC compliance solutions a request and they sent you back something on this date. You maybe send one to someone like three or four times, document that. If you don't get something back, you can show like, listen, I tried, I sent an email to Kate three times, she never responded, I moved on. And then the other thing to think about too is if you have problems with a vendor. So I have a client right now that's a private fund client. I don't know how familiar you guys are with private funds. But there, if you are the general partner to your private funds, you're, you have custody. So you have to get a, you have to get your funds, either a surprise exam of your funds or your, your funds financials need to be audited every year. Their auditor, who is a PCAOB, you know, if I said the name, you would recognize them for sure. Um, they are now six months late in getting their audited financials done. 
And my conversation with my client every time we talk is, how is the process with the funds financial? Have you gotten them done yet? They say no. I document it. Every time we talk, I document for them that they still don't have their audited financials. And I say, when was the last time you talked to them? And my client will pull up his emails and tell me the last time he spoke to his contact. And every time I speak to them, I say, gee, client, I really think you should consider changing your auditor. <laughs> At least do some due diligence on some others so that if you're examined and you try to blame your auditor for the reason why you haven't sent out your financial state, your audited financials to your investors, you can say, we've been talking to our auditor. We've reached out to them this many times. We are also in the process of doing due diligence on new ones. Whether or not you switch is up to you. I mean, a lot of times your auditors will have so much information and be so familiar with you. It can be a challenge to switch, but at least you show that it was something you thought about in your, this is part of due diligence, right? The service you're getting from your vendor. Yeah, good point. I, uh, the gentleman that I put in there is a cybersecurity expert for registered investment advisory practices. He, um, yeah, he, and I have become friends over the last couple of months and this is exactly what he does. Yep. Great questions. Love this conversation. I'll leave it open for anybody else who's got any, uh, anything to run by Katie. I'm trying to think of some other like hot topics. We talked about text messaging. Yeah, they're great examples. Vendor due diligence is a really good one. Um, having, um, you know, make so when when the FTC comes in to do an audit, they're going to ask for your annual review for the exam period. So it could be a year or two. So make sure you have something documented that you can show them, whether it's a memo talking about what you've done um, or testing and things you can show them. They'll ask for your risk assessment, which we actually do as part of our gap analysis in the beginning of the relationship. So if you don't have one, that is part of our offering that we do for all clients. So your risk assessment, they'll ask for your policies and procedures. So your compliance manual, your code of ethics. I would say if you don't do this already, it's a really great practice to edit your manual and track changes every year and keep the track changes version as its own standalone version. Because oftentimes the SEC wants a description of the changes from your policies. That's and I, I say to my clients, don't write up, you don't have time to write up all the changes. Just provide them the document and track changes. Yeah, and make sure. it themselves. Um, so that's a good one too. And I do the same with ADVs. So when I am editing and drafting ADVs for my clients, I always have a lot of versions. I'll have last year's final version. Then I have this year's draft and track changes. Then I do a file save as for the final version that's all clean. But you'll have three versions, right? Last year's final, this year's draft, this year's final. Then repeat again for next year, right? So that we have in track changes what we were working on and we have a final. Um, what else? Who's like your best client? Or like what, what type of systems do they have in place to make working with you easy? I would so that's such a loaded question. Sure. You know, every client is different and I appreciate and love them for their differences, right? I think some things to keep in mind, like consistency is key, right? So like one thing that I find very challenging and frustrating, because I know down the road it's gonna cause trouble for my clients, is when they have fees. Like you guys all charge your client fees, that's how you make money. But you're not consistent in how you bill your clients. For example, let's say Kate and Katie, me and Kate, right? We're both clients and we both have a million dollars with you. You might charge Kate something different. Hmm. And, it, and it, it may be, and, and here's the distinction. Maybe Kate pays 1%, right? 100 basis points on her assets and I pay 75 basis points. Hopefully that's because I'm a family discount and you've got like me, my husband, our kids, my parents, my aunts and uncles or something, right? That sure. you can say, well, listen, this is a family and it's, but you're consistent right? Be consistent. Having a lot of different exceptions is a nightmare when the SEC comes in. Because then you have to kind of defend yourself. Like what is Katie Mogan getting that Kate is, or what is Kate getting? Right. Because she's paying more than me than what Katie's getting. You have to like right? justify it. You have to justify it. So, and it, it, this happens a lot when advisors are new and they're making a lot of exceptions. And then you get to a certain point 
and you've given all these concessions at the beginning and then as you're shifting and you're not you still have to justify that right yeah. and I have seen and here's where this can be painful I have seen my clients have to reimburse clients for fees because they didn't bill them right whether it's to their agreement or like the inconsistency in, in invoices and in, in invoicing the SEC says you're not treating these like clients the same way so it may be okay to do it just make sure you you're consistent in applying this methodology of why that's probably like the biggest pain point for me with clients because we will test fees and billing and stuff and then you've got like here's a fee schedule for this client but there's a different fee schedule for this client I said well tell me the services and the differences and there isn't any yeah and so that can get you in trouble well, I would say not necessarily in trouble, but it can cause a discomfort. It's hard to manage. Yeah. You, honestly, one of the key things that I, I say, consistency is key probably more than any other phrase. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's it. one thing. And then I think another is oftentimes like you need to think about any change to your business with compliance side by side to that decision, not after you decide to make a change, because there may be things that you are prohibited from doing or you are allowed to do, but there are certain things you have to do to be allowed to do it, right? Like, like solicitation, for example, now we call it promoting, right? You can pay for testimonials, you can pay for endorsements. If you're gonna pay for an endorsement, you have to have, your policies have to say that you're gonna do that activity, right? They have to basically allow for it. But then there are certain disclosures to the client. Um, there are certain requirements in terms of how much you're paying them. You have to have a written agreement. And so oftentimes I'll find, like this actually happened with a client I have now that's being, that just got their first letter from the SEC. So we're trying to figure out how to, how to explain this to the SEC. But let me tell you the problem. They were paying a solicitor who was not registered. Um, and they say, well, we didn't know he needed to be registered. The SEC doesn't care if you didn't know you had to be doing something. So that's really important to understand too. Like if you're in this business, if you're doing this, you're a registered investment advisor, you're expected to know all these things. But so the problem is they were soliciting and being paid to bring clients to the firm, even though they weren't registered. So now our challenge is how do we talk to the SEC about this relationship and explain it to them? So first and foremost, as soon as we just as soon as it was brought to my attention from my client that they were paying a solicitor who wasn't registered, I said, well, let's register them. You, you do a U4 to register this individual in the state where they're soliciting clients on your behalf. So we have started that process. And to be honest, that's kind of the best we can do. Yeah. There is a chance that, the, that my client has to pay back, has to pull back from the solicitor all the fees that they paid him for this work because he wasn't appropriately registered. We'll see what happens. Yeah. And they were not, they were told, so my client was told by their prior consultant that he didn't need to be registered. So we will certainly bring that up to the SEC, but it's hard to say if they'll care and 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 take pity, you know, and, and be forgiving about it. I don't know. Too well, that's the value of having somebody like you guys, an expert on their team that they can bounce ideas off of or just be a sounding board so you don't get yourself in hot water like that. Yeah. And my client pushed back when she told me the scenario and I said, he needs to be registered. She said, I really don't want to register him. And I said, well, then you can't pay him for this work. I understand. Yeah. Oh. Cause there, there's, and so we have this conversation and, and I say the risk, there's a lot of risk. So anyway. Oh man. Yeah, this is really questions? interesting. They're great examples. Yeah. we got a couple more minutes guys. If anybody has any questions. Otherwise, we'll send a follow-up email, Katie, with your contact information and your email so that everybody um, can get more information. Yeah. And I would say, too, if you have specific questions about your firm, I'm happy to answer them at no charge. Um, if you're interested in chatting more about services specifically for your firm and what that would look like and how the relationship would work, we can set up a call. It's usually about 30 minutes. Um, but reach out. Yeah. Don't be shy. Well, I appreciate your time. This was a really fun conversation. I love everybody's engagement and the questions. So thank you guys for all hanging out and participating. Katie, we'll do this again soon. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you everyone so much. Great questions. I hope to hear from you all soon. Have a great afternoon. See you guys. So, bye.